Hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So yeah, I see you, Dennis. I see you. Kennedy, I see you. My foes, Diallo, I see you. Dennis Musembi. I hope I pronounce your name. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Please let us know where you're you are streaming from or where you're coming from. Lagos, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, all around the world. Let's see to the chat. Daniel Ojo Williams, I see you. Welcome. Welcome. Let's know in the chat where you're calling from, how are you doing, or where you're streaming from, actually. How are you doing today? Then we would kick off as soon as possible. My colleague Imo, like I said earlier, is not um, available at the moment. So I have to set up the studio and then do some other things and also take the session at the same time, which is a lot of work, you know. Jennifer from Lagos, Nigeria. Samuel from Lagos. Kennedy, my man from Abuja. I see you. I see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Ojo, where are you coming from? Daniel Ojo Williams. Where are you calling us from or where are you streaming from? Hey, Dennis is from Nairobi, Kenya. Beautiful. Welcome, Dennis. Welcome. All right, guys. So I will be taking today's session. My name is Ukeme David Eseme, your humble DevOps engineer at your service. <laughs> okay, so I will just ah uh -uh, Amarachi. Hey, that's my person. Amarachi, welcome. How do they say welcome in Igbo? Amarachi is, is coming from Edugu. That's my person. That's my classmates. Welcome. Thanks for the support, though. All right, guys. So today I will be taking introduction to DevOps, containers, and serverless computing on AWS. Let's get to it. This is my slide. Um, push this down. Cool. Good. So introduction, Temi Tokpe from Lagos. Welcome, Temi Tokpe Agbola. I hope you learn a thing or two about DevOps today. So DevOps is a very interesting topic. And sometimes um, some people who are already developers do not know the importance of DevOps until when they want to deploy their application. That's when they know that DevOps on its own is a different field entirely, entirely and it's very important in the sense that as a developer, you have an application that is running on localhost, which is on your computer, yeah? It works, but then you want someone else to be able to access that your application you get. You want that application to be globally accessible and then you find out that it works on your computer, but it doesn't work on other people's computers. And you start to ask yourself, what's the problem? Why is that so? That's where DevOps comes in. DevOps basically helps with deployment. You know, um, we would, DevOps would help you with provisioning infrastructure in the sense that we create an environment, a consistent environment where your application can thrive. And then we kind of like create a workflow which is a pipeline for other developers to work on the same project. And then we help with releases in terms of quick release. So back in the days when people develop, it, it takes a long while before they go into production stage or they release their products. Okay. I'm actually saying I can testify to that. I learned the, the hard way. Yes. Yes. You know, so where, where was I? So with DevOps, yeah, <clears throat> you can release almost quick releases. You can release and deploy almost every day. You can also test while before you release. You can also automate your testing, check if everything is working. In fact, the entire process of from a Git commit to building the application to testing the application 
to deploying the application is a whole process on its own. And with DevOps, you can literally op automate most of that and then go to sleep. And then your application is running, but you need to get metrics. Okay, how is this server doing? How many people are visiting? Um, why is one section of the application working and the other isn't working? We can also put something called monitoring in that entire pipeline. So we monitor it, get metrics in real time. And all of this is happening in real time. We see that there's a flaw somewhere. We've automated testing, we've automated um, monitoring and immediately the system would inform you that this is going on. This is the problem, you know, quick fix. Let's work on it. You work on it and immediately is in deployment or well, not immediately, but in a very short period of time is in deployment. So there's, there's a whole process with DevOps, which is very, very interesting. And if you want to get into DevOps and when you start working on terminals, you start working on a server, building servers, configuring servers, you know, it gets very, very interesting. So let's go into it today. So we're doing introduction to DevOps, containers, and serverless computing. People say serverless. What does that really mean? We'll get to that. Um, so the next slide, this is a lot of words here, but I'll just came through it. It's an overview of DevOps. So DevOps, containers, and serverless computing are three essential components of modern software development and deployment. DevOps combines software development and IT operations. That's the dev, which is the development, IT operations, which is the ops, so DevOps, promoting collaboration and efficiency through continuous integration, delivery, and deployment. So that's CICD, continuous integration, continuous delivery, all right? It's sounding more interesting now. Don't worry, we'll get to practicals. Then containers, what exactly is a container? So containers provide a lightweight and portable way to package your applications and their dependencies, enabling scalability and resource efficiency. What does that, what does this mean in layman terms? So basically when you finish building your application, what we can do to solve that problem of, oh, my application is working here. It's not working in this environment. This, this person can access it, this person can access it. Is to package all of that application, package everything into something very lightweight that has majorly the binaries and the things that it requires to run. We package it, yeah, and then put it somewhere in a registry where other people can also access it, you get. So we, we're saying package the applications and their dependencies, we've co covered that, enabling scalability. Now the scalability part is where cloud comes in most of the time. So you have a website or an application which is enterprise level. You have close to like 5,000 people hitting that site. This site is running on two servers, let's say an EC2, two EC2 instances. At some point, it's going to get to a max. That's when you start seeing that, oh, this site is crashing. Um, jam site is crashing. It's because they don't have auto scaling or a bank website is not reachable sometimes. It's because they don't have auto scaling. So with auto scaling there, once the system notices that, okay, the threshold for two EC2 instance, which is the server is 5,000. Once it gets to 5,001, 5,002, what the system would do intelligently is to create another server to accommodate that. So that's when you're scaling up, right? You're scaling up, create another server to accommodate that. And then when you have less peak periods, let's say, for example, out of like you're having you scale, scaled up because you have like 7,000 people hit your server. And then in the night, you have less people hitting your server. So you have like, let's just say 2,000 people on that server. It's going to scale down. So there's no point. That's why cloud is better than on-prem. On-premises, once you've provisioned that three, servers you keep paying for that whether you're using it or you're not using it you keep paying for it but with cloud here yeah, it's it would scale down to the the amount to accommodate the amount of traffic that is there at that point so it means you had three servers before it scaled down two is out you're no more paying for that two you now you're now paying for one when the peak period comes it scales up you pay for what you use it basically so resource efficiency as what I just explained. So the next slide. So 
what serverless computing is an abstract way is an abstract way i'm sorry it abstracts <laughs> it abstracts away infrastructure management allowing developers to focus on writing code and automatically scaling resources based on demand i've explained that automatically scaling resources based on demand but what does it mean for those who are new to them but when it says it abstracts away infrastructure management when you say you have a serverless infrastructure what that basically means is that you are not managing the servers there's no point for you trying to be an admin going back to the back end and checking what's going on what's breaking okay it's time for us to scale let me go and manually scale it no with serverless computing aws or the cloud cloud um cloud uh, provider manages your infrastructure for you that's why aws is good they take away the load from for you you know and manage that those servers that's what it means by serverless so together these technologies revolutionize as that's devops containers and serverless these technologies where you put them together they revolutionize software development by streamlining processes improving scalability and producing operational complexities you know that's oppression reducing operational complexities also is like managing that server is is a complex thing on its own doing some automation is also a complex thing on its own so it reduces that uh, operational complexity um next slide so devops on aws this is an overview of basically a a ci cd pipeline right i think i covered this uh two weeks ago yeah i did but well, we'll go we'll go again on this so this is the process if you know this you've almost known devops it's not like you've known everything but you you understand the software development life cycle of the devops engineer or a, or a project when you're doing devops so it starts with the author right the author basically is, is, is an ide for example vs code right but with aws we have our own we have a product for everything that's in the market space almost everything that's in the market so our own id is called cloud nine right we'll check this out later our ide is cloud nine so it starts with auto writing your code then the next process is source control source control github right you're pushing your your code to a single place oh bank bank is from guinea Welcome back. So we are, we are pushing your code to a specific source of truth. Do you get? So that source of truth is your uh, uh, GitHub in some cases, in most cases, or Bitbucket. But then with AWS, we have code commits, right? So the next stage is now the building stage. We have AWS code build. This would help you build your application. Right. The next step now is testing. So in code build, you can integrate some other third party softwares to help you run your testing. Right. If you are already in DevOps, you should know Jenkins. Jenkins is also a CI CD tool. Jenkins is a very popular CI CD tool, and that with Jenkins, you can add plugins to do most of all of these stages or all of this uh, uh, these stages, actually. So you can do your testing on code build using a third party. Give me 30 seconds, please. all right so that's for testing sorry about that so the next stage is the deployment so with deployment we use aws code deploy to do our deployment in some cases people people use argo cd to do deployment some people also use jenkins to do their deployment and then the next thing is to monitor and then with monitoring you you can use cloudwatch so cloudwatch or prometheus or whatnot or fluent d so these all of these are logging 
login resources should i say login services they help you log information and then that lets you gives you information of what is going wrong or where you are performing at best you know you use that to get your metrics so this is the cycle so if anything breaks in between it's going to give you feedback and then you go back to the beginning which is hot or you have to now check the code and then you know make the adjustment immediately you've made the adjustment you push the github it is going to automatically trigger an event and that event just takes you throughout the entire process so the next slide i hope you get that if you have any questions please put your questions in the chat let me know if you need me to take anything or explain anything all right so um containers yeah we're back to containers now the concept of containers and the advantages is software development so containers are lightweight yes stand alone and executable units that's of software that package software and its dependencies enabling consistent underline that consistent enabling consistent deployment across different environments so the best thing is that put your app package your application at the container that that was the first that's the first step of solving the problem of oh is working here is not working here right so what are the advantages portability i just explained that right now um scalability i explained that also you can scale up scale down to accommodate resource efficiency you are basically using you are basically using the binaries that are needed if you write your docker file well uh, you will reduce the size and only the necessary binaries that are needed to make the application to run is what's going to be there instead of the traditional way where you have you've done npm npm um, i npm install and then there, there's just a bunch of packages your your application is not resource efficient right if that best puts it so the next thing now is isolation so with when we say isolation it basically means okay i've packaged this thing and i want it to run in an isolated environment which is the container right reproducibility reproducibility so that basically means okay if i've run if i've run this application now i can create multiple instances of it i can create multiple instances running on different ports and they're all running at the same time unlike local host where if you've let's say you do npm start now for those who write Node.js or node if you do or react if you do npm start now it basically will just define a port for you let's say port 5000 they're running on port 5000 and that's it but with in terms of reduce reduce a bit uh, reproducibility <laughs> in um in a container you can basically reproduce that particular application in another container make whatever changes you are running you want to make and then put um, um, uh, upload it to a specific port or open a specific port where people can access it do you get you can do that multiple times so you have like five or six uh, versions of the same application running with specific different modifications to each of them i hope you are with me please let me know if you have any questions continuous integration and deployment containers facilitate streamlined cicd processes right i've mentioned that already versioning and rollback yes so i mentioned something that sounds like versioning so if i have this application running in an isolated environment version one i make another change in my source code i push build everything create the container again version two version one and version two can still be running at the same time but the point is you have two versions so if there's something wrong with the latest version you can always roll back to the previous version so that those are like key takeaways and advantages of using containers there's a lot more in practice you will see that man this container team man man <laughs> you get the point so um next yeah so containers on aws right so 
these are this chart is showing you aws services container services so container services service combination on aws on the left hand side we have the eks tree on the right hand side we have the ecs tree i'll explain what those acronyms are so on the left hand side eks basically we'll start there the left hand side eks basically means elastic kubernetes service so what is kubernetes yeah kubernetes is a container orchestration service or a container orchestration tool what does container orchestration mean if you have a microservice um, architecture for example netflix runs on microservices microservices in the sense that your application is loosely coupled in the sense that you have your database as a microservice you have your login just the login part as a microservice you have your home page as a microservice you have your header as a microservice you have your every single component you break that down into different services for e-commerce now you have a microservice that handles checkout you have a microservice that handles payment you have you get so if the reason why it's like that is for for reliability if one of those services is down it doesn't mean the entire application should crash i'm actually can can testify to this when we, when we're working on a specific project and then and then you you write some code and something just goes off in a monolithic application everything is going to crash the application will not work it's going to spit out errors but in a microservice the error is peculiar peculiar how do you pronounce it peculiar peculiar to that specific service that is down so if checkout is not working that doesn't mean the e-commerce website should go down that doesn't mean the login should not work that doesn't mean profile should not profile should not work right so david covered microservices yesterday going back to this chat ah, i went on a spree there going back to this chart elastic kubernetes service will now elastic kubernetes service which is eks is a is a Kubernetes is a container orchestration tool. So it manages each microservice as a container, right? So this is the version that AWS has. This is AWS version of Kubernetes, EKS. That's why they wrote orchestration tool there on the left-hand side. So when you're using EKS, you have to create, when you're using Kubernetes in general, you have to create a cluster. A cluster where your application is going to live in now what is that cluster a cluster is basically a collection of servers right so in creating those collection of servers there are two types in aws actually more than two but eks is using these two primarily ec2 we know what ec2 is um, is a server and then fargate we know what fargate is um fargate is also a server but it's serverless Fargate is serverless. Like I said, serverless, you are not managing the servers. It's just AWS has provided that management for you. AWS is going to manage it for you. So your job is just to code and deploy, right? So EC2 is not managed. It's not serverless, right? So those are the hosting types. You can use these two to create your cluster. So on the right-hand side now, we have um, the orchestration tool of ECS. What is ECS? ECS is basically Elastic Container Service. Remember, EKS is Elastic Kubernetes Service, right? EK, uh, sorry, ECS is now Elastic Container Service. Okay. So with ECS now, um, ECS is basically synonymous to, should I say Docker? Yes, if you know what Docker is, Docker is a container service. It creates containers out of your application. So that's that's like um, AWS version of that ECS. So it helps you create that abstraction of an isolated environment, which creates, which is a container basically for your application to run. So the same hosting type, uh, 
EC2, which is a server that is not managed, Fargate, which is a server. Okay, there's a question from Kennedy. Let me see if that will show here. Um, hold up, hold up, hold up. Oops. Yeah, so there's a question from Kennedy which says, what's the difference between EKS and ECS? EKS is using Kubernetes. ECS is a container service, something like packaging your application into a container, like Docker, creating a Docker image out of your application. I hope that answers it. So EKS is Kubernetes, ECS is container, Kubernetes and Docker, right? Okay, so next slide. AWS container options by layer. I hope you can see this. This is possible to. Um, okay. AWS container uh, container options by layer. So these are AWS services that you can use to create containers. You know, that you can create containers out of or have some form of affiliation with containers. There's AWS App Runner. So this is the first assignment. Anybody, sorry, this is the first quiz. Anybody who gets this would the first person to get it will get it twenty five dollars. AWS credits. Define AWS app runner. That's the first one. So moving on, AWS app runner, um, AWS Elastic Beanstalk, Amazon Light Sale. That's the first quiz. Define AWS app runner. So these three now are basically provisioning services. You use these to provision. Give me a minute, please. Give me a minute. So there's nobody, nobody's answering the question. You don't want $25 AWS credits. So the, on the top layer is what we use to provision um, provision servers, right? On the second layer is the orchestration layer, which you have the ECS, we've explained that, EKS, we've explained that, IOSA is read as open shift. And then on the lower corner is the capacity layer, where you have Tolu Arena. Let me put that up. So Tolu is the first person. He's always getting all the twenty-five dollars, uh, and he's going to get this one. So AWS, what's this? All runners. It's not all runners. So it's app runners. So. AWS oh, <laughs> all runners is a container application for containerized applications without prior infrastructure or container experience. Uh, yes. But is AWS app runner? It's not all runner. So, uh, so Tolu gets it actually. So Tolu gets the the credit. All right. So we've covered this now. We'll get to practicals very soon. There's no time. So serverless computing on AWS. Serverless computing is a cloud computing execution model where developers can focus solely on writing code without having to manage the underlying infrastructure. We've covered this before. Tochuko Akpara, welcome. So what are the benefits of serverless computing on AWS? We have events-driven infrastructure. So serverless computing follows an event-driven model where functions or services are triggered by specific events or requests, right? So functions start when there is a trigger so when something happens something else should happen right so event-driven architecture 
automatic scaling i've mentioned this before service serverless platforms automatically scale the resources associated to execute functions based on the incoming workload i'm sure you get that i'm just trying to speed this up so we get to practicals on time pay per use pricing with serverless computing users are built based on the actual usage of resources rather than pre-allocated capacity so this is the thing about on-prem and server so we on-prem you pay up front and whether you're using the service or not you are still paying but with serverless and aws cloud computing you pay for what you use right so no server management i said this before um you would not need to manage your servers because it's serverless right so serverless doesn't actually mean there's no server. There is a server. It's just that you are saying managing it. AWS will manage it for you. So this is serverless computing workflow right now. So in AWS, we have two very popular serverless services. Remember, EC2 is a compute service. EKS is a compute service, right? is our CPUs. So in terms of serverless, we have Lambda. Lambda runs code to retrieve local information. So with, with Lambda now, Lambda Lambda only runs, majorly they use Lambda for event-driven um, applications. So if nobody is hitting your servers, there's no, no point for the Lambda to run. It's when there's a request as when it now runs, you get. So if there's nobody visiting your website, which you use, lambda it won't it won't it won't run until someone makes a request do you get so that saves costs you know so this is the workflow s3 bucket you put your front end static website on it and an s3 bucket and then host it and then when the user clicks to get information it's api gateway api gateway app makes a rest api call to the endpoint right so once it gets the the call the api call to the to the to the endpoint that sends a message to um, aws lambda which runs the code lambda runs the code to retrieve the local information and possibly in that code is saying that you should go straight to a db to retrieve information and then it goes to dynamo db dynamo db is a new sql database the no sql serverless database provided by aws you know so this is our no sql serverless version you know um it is a counterpart to mongodb mongodb is also no sql but i don't know if mongodb is serverless but this is what we use at aws so dynamo db contains uh, takes the data and then passes it passes back to um pass it back to lambda and that passes it to the API gateway and then it shows on the user on the client screen, right? So that's it for this. So what I'm going to do now, we'll quickly do a quick practical and we would, um, well, what do we want to do today, Seth? Let's, uh, let's work with containers because if I say we should do CICD now, that'll take a lot of time. Let's create a container that runs a simple a simple server. Any cons for serverless computing? Well, right now, there are cons. There's nothing that doesn't have a con, right? So right now, there's this battle going on in terms of if you should actually use serverless sometimes some people who use serverless and they, do, they don't like properly design the architecture they get bottlenecks somewhere around the architecture or in the application they get bottlenecks and then they start paying more than they should you know um i think three weeks ago there was aws made an announcement about them going back to rethink about the architecture around serverless you know and people were scared that, oh, we've removed our application from monolithic to a serverless um, uh, format or infrastructure or architecture, and now you're telling us to go back. 
do you get so there's still talk around that you can do some research on the cons but i can't really pinpoint um case studies right now from the top of my head so that would be the second that would be the second quiz to get another 25 dollars so tolu or you now you're not you are not participating in this you've already gotten one so find out the cons for serverless computing post them in the chat first person who does it gets 25 dollars um aws uh, credits okay so i'm gonna try to share my screen right now um I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, like we said, we want to create a, a simple container right in, in a server create a simple server container right we use docker so wow two applications running here let's see mm. okay so i'm just basically going to create a new ec2 instance to create an ec2 instance you log into aws on the top right hand corner you or the top left hand corner you see services click on services scroll down to compute 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 this is compute you see ec2 click on that it takes you to this page right yeah so this is the ec2 dashboard yeah so on the left hand corner you click on instances and then on the top right you see launch instances so i'm going to launch click on that let's create a sample Sample server. So in this sample server, we want it to run Ubuntu, Ubuntu 20. We've done this before countless times, but why not do it again? This time I won't be using T2 micro. T2 micro is free tier. So we're creating the instance type. We'll use T3 small. T3 small gives you gives you two VC two virtual. Uh, CPUs and two gig of memory. We pick that, um, and then you create a key pair. I already created one before, so I'll just use that. I think DevOps pack. So leave every other thing as default. No wait. Um, yeah, create a create a security group. This we've checked this. It allows SSH, which is port twenty one. Allow also allow HTTP. Yes. And then scroll down, scroll down, scroll down to the end. Launch instance. Let's see if we can do this in less than eight minutes. Um, lack of control over infrastructure. Ah, it lacks customization. Okay, we'll come back to that. Yeah, so we've launched our instance. Now let's go into this instance and create a Docker install docker there so click on connect i'm going to use ec2 instance connect we have like eight minutes uh, okay so we're in this instance right now what we'll do is to apt updates so it's sudo app updates sudo oops what am i writing sudo apt updates yeah
Let me zoom in a bit. Okay, we've done that. The next thing is to install Docker. So we say, no, the next thing is to change us to a root user. So let's do sudo sudo dash i. Aha. Why is it slow? sudo dash i. Now we need to install Docker or before we install docker let's install um apache so if we installed so apache is a server so we install apache now I'm going, I'm just going to create something very simple. I'm going to echo, echo, um, this is a server. And then I would put that inside a file called index.html. So if I do ls, have that file there i can cut index html so, so i see this here this is a server okay so i can now um move or copy index.html to a file an apache file so i'll say that that's sorry to an apache folder which is in var slash www slash um html oops so it's index.html ah, can't spell m yeah so if i go into this folder now i should see that file there so if i do cd slash var slash HTML by ls at index.html. So the file is there. So now what I want to do is to make sure this is showing on the server. So let's see, first of all, see is if Apache is running. So service um, Apache to status. So it's showing that Apache is running here. Um, so let me first of all hmm. let me check the security group for this instance so where is that instance um, this is it let's check the security group uh, in, check the inbound rules so we have this port open. We need to create a port for port 8080. HTTP mm, port 80. Okay, we've already this is it here actually. So I'm going to cancel this. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is I will take this IP and then so we see that this now we've created a server and this is the server is running if i modify that file if i say i know index to html and then add something to it if i add my name is ukeme david sm or smiley to it and i save and cut it to see yeah so it's there if i come back and refresh it let's see so that works so what the last thing i'm going to do now is to install docker and dockerize what's going on right now so i'm going to uh, how do you install docker out docker we're already out of time we have two minutes let me see docker 
So Docker dash V. Oops, so it's apt install docker dot io. Okay. We have two minutes. Hopefully, we get this done. See if there's any questions. Ah, I'm trying to moderate and also take the session at the same time. So it's very difficult for me to concentrate on one thing right now. So let me check if Docker is installed. We have Docker installed. Now we can um, Docker install uh, Docker. Let me see Docker images. We don't have any images here. So we create a Docker image, Docker pool, Ubuntu. Let's pull in Ubuntu. It's getting the latest version. So if we say Docker images, you see that the uh, Ubuntu is running. So let's create a container out of that. Um, so we will do hmm, Docker run as integrated terminal in detached mode. Uh, we want to run the Ubuntu latest and then in a bin slash bash environment. Right. So if we do Docker PS see this container is running so we want to go into that container now how do we do that i'll bring this back up i think it's docker exec yes exec. Um, yeah so this here is supposed to be the container id so i'll take 7 c f4 I'm getting it from here, container ID. If I do this, uh, oops, no, Docker, because I added this T here, uh, sorry, this D detached. So if I do this, yes. So now I am inside this container. Wow, spent time. Let's quickly rush through this. I'm inside the container now. You see 7 CF. So now I'm going to. Sorry guys, I was out for a bit. Um, please let me know where you where I stopped. Or where was the last place you had me? We have to finish this thing. So let me go back to this. Um, let me go back. So here, we're inside the container now. I'm going to install. Okay. Uh, Okay, this is what we'll do. Let's connect back. We have to finish this. We spent excess time. We have to finish it. We'll finish it. So I'm going to connect back. I lost. Okay, well, we're already back here. So I do Docker images. 
oh sudo sudo dash i docker images okay so we still have that docker ps we have that let's get into that container now so it's docker um exec um integrated terminal um 7 c f4 so that's the container id and then we want to do a bin slash bash terminal there we're inside now so if i we want to install apache so it is um apt install apache apache 2 Okay, so this is red apt which get install Apache Apache two. This is red. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we would basically because of time, we would basically stop here and this is it we have a devops group if you want to continue learning devops we have a devops group group i would advise you to join i am going to i'm going to send the link put the link in the chat so you can join Okay, so here I'll stop sharing my screen for now because I'm trying to get the class and then moderate at the same time. So we need a winner. Amarachi says code starts latency. The serverless platform typically spins up a new instance or function and then sounds like chat GPT all to the end. <laughs> and then uh, we have Kennedy is the first. It says the serverless architecture lacks customization. That's the con. Um, Samuel Ekele says lack of control over infrastructure, which is the same thing, Kennedy, as you said. Um, Daniel Dongo, I think I should be showing this thing. So Daniel Dongo is saying cons of serverless architecture, security of the architecture complexity of the setup less effective for long processes difficult to test replication of the production environment less or okay um kennedy again is saying like the serverless architecture architecture cannot be customized by the customer since everything is managed by aws the same thing and then Amarachi posted this very long. So we'll read some of it out, which is also correct. Cold start latency serverless platforms typically spin up a new instance of your function when it receives a request. If the function has not been recently used, there may be a delay known as a cold start. So everything here is correct. Um, but the first person is basically Kennedy, which posted this. Uh, sorry, this is what Kennedy posted. The serverless architecture lacks customization, which is which is basically it. You, because it's serverless, you can't customize it. So we'll stop here for today. Um, Kennedy and Tolu Arena will reach out to you. For you to get your um 25 aws voucher thank you everyone thank you everyone for coming please let me know if you have any questions we'll quickly um take those questions and then we'll call it a day any questions
okay i'll take that as no questions uh thank you everyone for coming please join the aws devop whatsapp group we basically we work on practical um practical projects you know work-based projects we teach you how it works how everything works we work on them together um i have sent the link on the whatsapp join the group sorry on the on the chat join the group thank you everyone and please have a wonderful day thank you